Welcome and greetings in the precious name of, of Jesus Christ. What a great time to be living in this day and hour that we're living today. I know the world is in chaos. I know we're living in a dark hour. But you've heard this phrase, I'm sure, the darker the, the, darker the night, the brighter the light shines. If we're walking with the Lord, there is no darkness in Him. We don't have to worry about the dark part because our Lord walks with us. What the world worries about, we don't even need to be concerned about because this world is not our home. We're just passing through. We don't trust in this worldly system we trust in the Almighty God. And I'm glad to be living in this day and time that we're living. Our, our scripture text today is from Peter, 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 10. Already they were wolves that were coming in sheep's clothing into the, into the early church. And they tried to pervert and twist the gospel of Christ. So the apostles wrote in letters encouraging the church what they need to do and how they need to keep their focus. So Peter is writing to the church here, those that are scattered abroad. He said, Wherefore the rather, brethren, give diligence to make your calling and election sure. For if you do these things, ye shall never fall. When was the last time that you checked your foundation? Are you sure you're on the right foundation? These are so very important questions. The message the apostles preached is not the same message that is being preached today over the pulpits. As far as the plan of salvation, or may I say it this way, our, doc, our foundation. When we think of our foundation, the foundation of our home, we don't think very much about it. We don't think very much about it other than we just don't give it much thought. But if we think about it a little bit, we will understand that our foundation is very, very important. If the foundation is not right, then the structure that is built on the foundation will have flaws and it will not be right also. And our spiritual house is no different. If we don't get our foundation right, then we have real problems when we go to build upon this foundation. The foundation of our home is made up of, it's very simple, of water and sand and concrete mix mixed with rebar and steel to, to give it strength. And once it's cured, then if it's done right, then we can build our house upon it. And the spiritual house, the ingredients in the foundation, and we will bear this out as we study along, is repentance, baptism in the name of Jesus Christ, and water, for the remission of sins and being filled with the Holy Ghost, which is the born again experience. In Ephesians, Ephesians chapter 2, verse 20, it says, We are built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ being the, the chief cornerstone, He is our beginning. In Strong's 2310, the, the Greek word, I don't know how to say it, but the translated in the English is themelios. And it means foundation. But this is what this is what it really means. The first beginning of truth. The first the first principles. The first doctrine. And this is found in the book of Acts, chapter two. 
This is what we must be built upon. This is what the church must teach. So here in Hebrews chapter 6, Paul is telling us what the foundation really is. He said, Therefore, leaving the principles of the doctrine of Christ, let us go on unto perfection, not laying again the foundation of repentance. You see, repentance is part of our foundation that we must learn first. And we know this from dead works and of faith toward God and of, of the doctrine of baptisms. Don't be confused about that word baptisms. It is talking about water baptism and baptism of the Spirit and of laying on of hands and of resurrection of the dead and of eternal judgment. You see, verse 1 and 2 is simply saying, Church, it's time to grow up. We have laid our foundation of repentance and baptism. Now it's time to build our house. And that's what Paul was saying here in Hebrews chapter 6, verses 1 through 2. In Acts chapter 2 is where the church began. You won't find it in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. You won't find it in the epistles. You won't find it in the book of Revelation. You will find it in the book of Acts, where the church began. In Acts chapter 2, verses 1 through 4, tells us exactly how it happened. It says, And when the day of Pentecost was fully come, uh, they were with, with one accord and in one place. And verse 2 says, Suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind. And verse 3 says, It filled all the house where they were sitting, and cloven tongues like as a fire set upon each of them. And verse 4 says, And they were filled with the Holy Ghost, and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit of God gave the utterance. This was such a, a magnificent experience until those that were in the upper room in Jerusalem could no longer stay there. They spilled out into the street. They were so happy. They were so full of joy. No longer could this upper room hold them. They spilled out into the streets. Now this was the day of Pentecost. And the Bible says there were people there, devout people from all over the world, from every nation. And there were people there of 17, 17 different languages. And the Bible says that when they spilled out into the streets, these Galileans were speaking in these 17 different languages. And these people said, how can this be so? These are Galileans. How can we hear them speaking in our language? Then they said, this must be one, the wonderful works of God. Then all of a sudden, they begin to say, oh, these people are drunk. Yeah, I've been drunk a few times. Not with alcohol or drugs, but on the Spirit of the Lord. Yeah, it really does happen. But as Peter, Peter began to preach when they said, you're drunk. Peter said, these are not drunk like you think they are. But this is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel. And he began to preach to them a message of what had happened to the Lord and how they had crucified him with their wicked hands. And all of a sudden they began to feel sorrow in their heart. And in uh, Acts chapter 2, verse 37, Now when they heard this, they were pricked in their heart and said unto Peter and to the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, What shall we do? What do we need to do to fix this situation? What must we do? Then Peter said unto them, Repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. What a message 
This is the foundation. It's simple. It's not hard. It's a simple message. But the world has taken it and twisted it to such a degree until the name of Jesus Christ has become unimportant. The name of the Lord hadn't, hadn't become unimportant. Unimportant. These are false teachers and false preachers that declare this. And they don't declare it with their words. They declare it with their actions when they will not baptize in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. The majority of you can ask your preacher, will you baptize me in Jesus' name? And most of them will say no. We baptize according to Matthew 28, 19. But look at verse 41. Then they that gladly received his word were baptized. And the same day they were added unto them about 3,000 souls. So the first day of the church... 3,000 people were added to the church that day. Did you know 99.8% of all the churches do not teach this message? Acts chapter 2 verse 38. It is the foundation of the church. Don't, don't, don't let someone build the wrong foundation for you because it's all important that it is done right. Why? After seeing this is so plain when the church had began, why do they not teach this message? That's a good question. So please follow me in these next few slides for the reason why. Maybe I can give some perspective on why. If we go out to eat, and the waitress brings our bill and we see they charge us too much. We are the first to correct this situation. We're not going to walk out of there unless that thing is corrected. And here's why. And the reason why I use examples like this is to show how we react to things that really matter to us. People will get all bent out of shape about their money about their home, about their car, but never questions why the preacher baptizes differently than the apostles. Why is that? They don't think that the message that was preached on the day of Pentecost really matters, that it's unimportant. I would say most people that go to church have no idea how the pastor baptizes whether it be according to Matthew 28, 19 or Acts chapter 2, verse 38. So why is that? Because there is no concept among the people of how important the foundation is. It's very important. Do we think the message that Peter preached on the day of Pentecost was, was not important? That was the first message that was preached to the newborn church. And the foundation had to be laid at that time because they were going to build on this foundation. It is our foundation. That message that Peter preached on the day of Pentecost is still the message today. Many churches do not believe baptism is important. And preachers who do, who do not believe that baptism is not important are wolves in sheep's clothing. They are false preachers and teachers. And those preachers and teachers that do not believe that the name of Jesus Christ is important in baptism are wolves in sheep's clothing. And they are false teachers and false preachers. I will prove this in this Bible study. Look at what Paul had to say to the Galatian church about false doctrine, about someone coming in and trying to change the foundation that he had already laid. Galatians 1 and 6 through 9. He said, I marvel that ye are so soon removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ unto another gospel 
which is not another. But there be some that trouble you and would pervert the gospel of Christ. There are so many voices today. And they're doing exactly that, perverting the gospel of Christ. They're changing, they have changed the foundation. That word pervert means to corrupt means to change, means to twist. But listen to what Paul says to the church. He said, but though we or an angel from heaven preach any of the gospel unto you than that which we have preached unto you, let him be accursed. And he said it again. As we said before, so say I now again. If any man preach unto you any other gospel unto you than that ye have received, let him be accursed. Those are strong words, and they need to be said again today. For the foundation of our house is important. Sounds to me, Paul is very serious about the doctrine, about the foundation that he had already laid for the church here. And I tell you something today in Galatians chapter 1, verse 6 through 9. That word still applies today in our day and time. Oh, it is so very important that we heed what the Word of God says. The foundation, our foundation has to be right. If it's not right, the building that we build on it is not right either. Have you ever asked your preacher why do you baptize like Matthew 28, 19 when no one in the New Testament church was baptized that way? I bet you have never thought about that before. Why? Because most people just take what the preacher says without any study of their own to verify what he is teaching and preaching is true or not especially about foundation because there are many views and many thoughts and many doctrines upon what people think today about the foundation. Some churches say the only thing you got to do is believe. Just confess with your mouth and that's all you need to do. Is that what the apostles preached on the day of Pentecost? Peter preached and laid the foundation in Acts chapter 2, verse 38. Philip preached the same message in the 8th chapter of Acts to the Samaritans when revival broke out. Peter preached to the Gentiles, Cornelius' household, and preached the same message that he preached on the day of Pentecost as far as foundation is concerned. And Paul, in the 19th chapter of Acts, rebaptized John disciples, John John the Baptist disciples. He rebaptized them in the name of the Lord Jesus. Because the foundation was already established. And Peter set it forth in Acts chapter two, verse thirty eight. And it's good that we understand this. Did you know that Mark and Luke wrote about the same great commission that Matthew wrote about in, in, 20, in Matthew 28, 19 through 20. Mark said it this way, and this is how he wrote it. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. He that believeth not shall be damned. And Luke wrote it this way. This is how Luke wrote it. The same commission that Matthew wrote it, that Matthew wrote, but this is how Luke wrote it in verse in Luke 24, verse 46 and 47. For thus it behooved Christ to suffer and to die and to be raised from the dead the third day, that repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name. He didn't say anything, Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. He said in his name beginning at Jerusalem, beginning at Jerusalem. Let's talk about this a little bit more. And Peter, in Acts chapter 2, verse 38, 
Then Peter said unto them, Repent, and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of, of, of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. 99.8% of all the churches and those that see this video presentation here was not baptized and is not baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. Why is that? When did it change? When did the name of Jesus Christ become unimportant in baptism? Let's talk about it for a few minutes. So before I go any further, let me answer the question. When did it change? That's a good question. And it needs to be told. Here is what happened. The church had been through much persecution. And it began in the seventh chapter of Acts when they killed Stephen. Finally, there was a Roman emperor named Constantine that promised the church peace. So the church compromised and they traded doctrine for peace. Here is where the doctrine of baptism was changed from the apostles doctrine to the to the doctrine of the Nicene Creed. 325 through 381 AD. You can search Google. It's there under the Council of Nicaea. The mode of baptism was changed from being baptized in the name of Jesus Christ in the book of Acts to the formula of Matthew 28, 19 at the Council of Nicaea. 325 AD and finalized at the Council of Constantinople in 381 AD, this is the adopted version of the Nicene Creed. Most Protestant churches do, do not know that they teach the doctrine of Catholicism because this is Catholic doctrine. Baptism in the name in, in Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. That is that began in AD 325. And you can study in Google. You can see it. I, that's why I found it. So here's another example. When you bought your home, the things that mostly interest you were how big is the kitchen? How big is the master bedroom? How many bedrooms does it have? How many bathrooms does it have? How many square feet does it have? Do you know the most important part of the house? Yep, you guessed it. It's the foundation. If the foundation isn't right, the house is not going to be right either. There are going to be cracks in the floor. There are going to be cracks in the walls. It is so important. The foundation is so very important. It is no different with our spiritual house. The foundation must be right. We are built upon the doctrine, or may I say, the foundation of the apostles and prophets. Our Lord Jesus Christ being Himself being the chief cornerstone or the beginning point. And I'm talking about the foundation of the church, the beginning. Jesus Christ is the beginning. He is the author and the finisher of our faith. So people say, well, what about Matthew 28, 19? Because 99.8% of the Christian world is baptized this way. Water baptism is part of the foundation and it must be right. Let's, let's look at Matthew 28, 19. I bet you've never seen this part before. Let me, let me uh, look at this scripture. When you read Matthew 28, 19, there's part of that scripture that people never see. Yeah, they read it. Yeah, they read it up a storm, but they don't see it. 
Let me let me show you what I'm talking about. Matthew 28, 19. Go ye therefore, teach all nations, and the Lord is speaking to his disciples. Teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of. That part people never see. They never see it in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. Where is a name in the scripture? There is no name in the scripture. These are descriptive titles. Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Let's look at it a little bit further. So I have a question. Is a name important? Well, you can answer this question. If you go to the bank to open a checking account, and many times... If you have a checking account, they're going to ask you your name. And you can tell you can sit there and tell them you, your name is Father all day long, but they're not going to give you any money out of the bank. Is a name important? If someone asks you, what is the name of your father? What do you say? If someone asks you, what is your name? You may be a son. You may be a father. You may be a husband, but that is not your name. If you have children, you may be a father, you may be a mother, but that is not your name. What I am saying, these are not names. These are descriptive titles. And does the name make a difference? The name makes a difference. The name of Jesus Christ makes all the difference in the world. If you're baptized, according to Matthew 28, 19, in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, you're not baptized in any name. When we're, when we're baptized in the name of Jesus Christ, this is where we take on the name of the Lord, Jesus Christ. We are sealed by His name at this time. Romans chapter 6, verses 3 through 4. Colossians chapter 2, verse 12. Do you know what these scriptures say? They say, we are buried with him by baptism. It doesn't say anything about them. He, he, we are buried with him by baptism. The name of Jesus Christ is most important when we're baptized. So I have a question. Yeah, I'm, I'm always full of questions, I guess. Was anyone in the New Testament church baptized according to Matthew 28, 19? Where it says, Go ye therefore into all nations, baptizing them in the name of you remember the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost? If you want to know the name of the Father, you can look in John chapter 5, verse 43. If you want to know the name of the Son, you can look in Matthew chapter 1, verse 21. If you want to know the name of the Holy Ghost, look in John chapter 14, Verse 26. So how can you find out how the New Testament church baptized? Can you find it in the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John? No. Because the church was not born yet. Would you look in the epistles, Romans through Jude? No, because the epistles were written to the churches that had already been established. They had already had their foundation laid. They had already repented of their sins and been baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of those sins and have received the Holy Ghost. Their foundation had already been laid. These letters to the churches are for corrections, for instructions, 
for a guide in how to walk with the Lord and how to handle certain situations. Would you look in the book of Revelation? No, because it's a book of prophecy. Would you look in the book of the Acts of the Apostles? Ding, 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 ding. Yes, because that is where the church began in Acts chapter 2, verses 1 through 4. And the foundation was laid in Acts chapter 2, verse 38. In Zechariah chapter 14, verse 9. This is the prophecy of the end time. And the Lord shall be king over all the earth. In that day, there shall be one Lord and his name one. This prophecy was fulfilled in Jesus Christ. In Acts chapter 4, Peter and John had been put in jail because of the healing of of the man at the gate called Beautiful in Acts chapter 3. They put him in jail. And when they let him out, they told them, you cannot speak in that name. And this is Peter and John's reply in Acts chapter 4 verse 12. Neither is there salvation in any other. For there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. Through the course of time, through history, the name of Jesus Christ has become diminished as far as doctrine is concerned, as far as our foundation is concerned. Let me tell you what the gospel is. The gospel is the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. That's what he came to do to purchase our salvation so that we could be a part of the kingdom of God. But the doctrine of the gospel or the foundation that we've been talking about here is repentance. And it's likened unto his death. Repentance means death, to die. Baptism in the name of Jesus Christ. We are buried with him. Romans chapter 6, verse 3 and 4. And Colossians chapter 2, verse 12. We are buried with him. It is likened unto his burial. And when we receive the baptism of the Holy Ghost, it is likened unto his resurrection. This is the doctrine of the gospel, the foundation that is laid. In 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 10, when he was writing to the church, voices had already come into the church. They were wolves in sheep's clothing, and they were diverting the focus away from what the apostles had already taught the foundation that they had already laid. And Peter is telling them, give diligence to make your calling and your election sure. It is so very important that we get it right. The foundation must be right. The foundation must be right. And the, and the message that is taught in most of the churches today is not the message that the apostles preached on the day of Pentecost. And some people say, well, that died out when the, when the apostles died. That's a lie from Satan. The Word of God doesn't change and it will never change. And it will not change in the church until the church is taken out of this world. So I pray that you would give the most earnest heed to the doctrine that you're taught. Thank you for joining me today. God bless you in Jesus' name. Amen.